Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Schnapp. It's my pleasure to participate in uh, this uh, Summers Institute um, on the theme, or at least this will be my theme, of culture, creativity, and industry viewed from two different angles, which are reflective of my own uh, practice. Uh, uh, and um, what I want to start by is really talking about how the intersection of these three factors adds up to something that um, is not unique to the cultural sector, but rather bridges the world of academic research, creative practice, but also industry and entrepreneurship. Um, so culture plus creativity plus industry. And I'll be looking at two cases. But perhaps because I'm a literary historian by training, I can't resist starting with the deeper meaning of each of those words. The word culture, of course, is associated with agriculture, with the tilling of land and the production of crops. In other words, with processes of preparation and planning all the way through to harvest, to their fruition. The word creativity, we associate with the imaginative faculties of human beings, but in reality, the word creativity goes all the way back to the Greek, the ancient Greek word, word that's associated with making, with poein, which indeed is the source word for poetry. Poetry was always a form of making, even making in the most physical, palpable sense, making rhythms, forging uh, uh, structures out of language. And that third word, industry, comes from its Latin usage associated with the notion of diligence, with the, the dogged pursuit of a task, or to put it in other words, with labor, with uh, work. So it's this mix of making, of fabrication, in other words, of labor, labor understood in both in terms of the mental and the manual arts, and preparation and planning uh, that conjoined put together uh, constitutes a complex of activity that really characterizes all kinds of forms of, <clears throat> of entrepreneurship, action, artistic practices. And the divisions that we often experience and we see and we perceive in our own environment, in my view, are largely false uh, distinctions. They're really not, they don't cut to the essence of these activities. And I hope in the course of these uh, reflections to demonstrate that principle through my own direct experience as a, as a practitioner in a number of different fields. So the, the X and Y here are the two facets of my own work, which I'm gonna use as an illustration for these larger um, clusters of endeavors. The first is running a research center, an experimental platform called MetaLab at Harvard, which uh, we like to describe as an idea foundry, a place where ideas are, are, are forged and experimented with, a knowledge design lab, a place where the production of knowledge and design processes and practices come together, and a production studio, a place where we make stuff, uh, literally. Uh, that stuff includes the digital realm, but it often links the digital realm to the analog realm. Um, and the, the why factor here is Piaggio Fast Forward, an, uh, an entrepreneurial venture, a startup in the field of robotics, which I am one of the co-founders of. Uh, and uh, many of my interests as a cultural historian have actually come to bear in my work in Piaggio Fast Forward, our collaborative work with the world famous uh, Piaggio Group associated with the Vespa scooter among many iconic vehicles of the history of uh, transportation. So these are two domains, but they're two domains that I hope to show you are interconnected in ways that I think are suggestive with respect to the role of the digital in uh, creative and cultural industries. Um, and again, I don't see the um, industry side of, here, of things here as somehow remote from or distinct from the culture and creativity. Side. So we're going to start with MetaLab at Harvard. That's my day job, so to speak. Um, and I've already um, hinted at some of the things that MetaLab does. Um, MetaLab falls loosely into the domain of what's sometimes referred to as the digital humanities. It's a label that, uh, even though I'm not 
hugely fond of it. It's a useful label, and it's one that I've adopted myself in a, a, a fairly influential book that I was the co-author of called Digital Underscore Humanities, a collaborative book um, that appeared a few years back with a couple of my co-conspirators on the West Coast. Um, but you'll notice there's a little underlining that joins together the word digital to the word humanities. And that underlining is the really at the core of the argument that this book makes. It stands for a bi-directional movement uh, between the digital and the humanistic. It suggests that when we think about the present and future of arts and humanities, it's not about adopting digital tools and technologies that were developed for industry and just applying them. On the contrary, it's the traffic across that divide that flows in both directions, where the humanities and the arts actually transform, modify, more, model, forge the digital itself as a cultural medium. And this bi-directional process is one that goes all the way back to the origins of post-World War II computing. Um, the founding father sometimes uh, of digital humanities is imagined as uh, Father uh, Buza, um, who in 1946, uh, uh, became engaged in perhaps the first project that directly brings together forms of humanistic inquiry with computational practices. Um, he started experimenting with transforming the Thomistic corpus. He was a scholar on uh, the work of the great scholastic uh, theologian Thomas Aquinas, um, applying computational methods to the study of the Thomistic corpus. Um, and uh, I cite this example only to suggest that these are long-term processes and didn't just be begin when the internet became a key feature of the uh, public and cultural space of our own time. For me, this adventure of bringing together uh, seeking predict productive collisions between the computational and the arts and hum humanities space and disciplines um, goes all the way back to my years in high school and then subsequently um, reassumed at when I assumed my first faculty position at Dartmouth College. On the left of the screen, you see a picture from, from 1984 with a, uh, a Kadem, a Kurzweil machine, where we were experimenting with how to get machines to read uh, 18th century uh, editions of Dante's Divine Comedy. That seemed like a hugely challenging task at the time. These early scanning and OCR machines were developed to read essentially industrially printed volumes, not you know, pre-modern or early modern editions. And through a whole series of experiments, we actually managed to get them, to train them to read materials which they were not designed for. And it's precisely that process of adaptation and invention where we go beyond the designed in features and attributes of, of technologies that innovation happens. And that is the kind of spirit that brought me in um, the, at the end of the, uh, the last millennium in 1999 to develop, to found the Stanford Humanities Lab um, at Stanford University, where I was teaching uh, subsequent to Dartmouth, where um, we really tried to experiment with building a platform between the School of, Computer, of um, Engineering and particular computer science um, at Stanford and the arts and humanities, um, not by a kind of high level theoretical reflection on how the two could talk to one another, but rather through hands on, <clears throat> hands on projects, making stuff, doing things, trying to solve interesting problems, trying to find interesting problems. So that's exactly, I think, that kind of space where culture, um, and by culture here I include scholarship, uh, forms of historical inquiry. Um, as well as cultural collections, uh, creativity, uh, Im imaginative approaches <clears throat> to problem solving, and um, industry understood in the sense of, of labor, of work. And um, it's that conjunction that um, uh, the same constellation of factors that informs the work of Metalab at Harvard. Uh, Metalab is the descendant <clears throat> of the Stanford Humanities Lab. Um, as you saw before, we call ourselves an idea foundry or a concept foundry, a knowledge design lab, and a production studio, and we're really a portfolio of projects with a community of people who are 
interested in um, experimenting with new cultural forms. And those people include artists, they include technologists, they include scholars like myself, um, and they particularly include designers, people who are engaged in forms of design practice that try to solve problems, tackle problems, to research through a series of iterative uh, design exercises, but then especially through implementation. And we work in a very <clears throat> broad range of um, fields, and I'm not gonna go into those, but I, I just um, put them on your screen so that you can have a peek at them. They include experiments with new kinds of media forms, um, database storytelling, the construction of archives, the design of interactive exhibition uh, uh, experiences. Um, and th these are just a couple of the kinds of areas. And, and many of these uh, er fields are fields that are shared with other, uh, with other uh, similarly minded experimental groups throughout the university world, but beyond the university world, design studios, uh, uh, artist collaboratives, uh, startups for that matter. Um, we're particularly interested in public culture and creating forms of research that speak to and are accessible to large audiences, not just the audiences of um, specialized monographs or print uh, publications or digital equivalents. Uh, so in short, this in enterprise of building a kind of space of experimentation between fields of engineering, technology, uh, and the like, and art and culture um, is a space that is, has as its core a set of ambitions that um, uh, really engage um, in value-laden and value-infused uh, forms of production uh, that link the digital to the analog, the mental to the manual. Um, these are not separations that, um, or these dichotomies do not shape our practice. We uh, see them as obstacles more than as opportunities. And many of the domains that this experimentation happens in involve creating new genres of cultural practice or scholarly practice, designing new experiences, thinking about how archives, for example, could become memory sites, not just uh, supports for uh, historical inquiry decades after the events that they document and so on and so forth. Um, I'd like to call this field knowledge design. Um, it's just one label, a different label, for grouping together these forms of experimentation with new genres and forms, with new bridges between the analog and the digital, for new modes of storytelling, for um, creating new modes, uh, new kinds of audiences for expert knowledge, um, in particular in the historical fields. And at the core of this enterprise, it, and the biggest shift, I suppose, is that people in the arts and humanities fields traditionally had not thought of the world of data as somehow integral to what they do. But a lot of the work that we do, not all of it at places like MetaLab, um, really embraces the notion that data can be beautiful, meaningful, critically important. And I'm just going to very quickly show a few examples of the kind of amazing work that creative people do with data sources that don't come necessarily from the cultural field, but they end up in the social and cultural field thanks to the work of the creative and critical work of uh, data visualization um, uh, practice, practitioners. So, I mean, here's an example of a representation of the history of the universe done by a student a mapping of the field of philosophy done by a graduate student. Uh, no, these are not graduate students of mine, by the way. These are students who just posted their work online and um, they're beautiful illustrations of the kinds of things we can do with data. Here's one that comes from my own world, which is uh, an illustration for an argumentative piece about the history of an archive um, in the form of a, a data visualization of the entire history of a botanical garden, the Arnold Arboretum, uh, which is run by Harvard University. Here's one that we did as an experiment showing the whole history of editions of the Divine Comedy of Dante's poem uh, from manuscripts, which are in purple along the base of the uh, cartography that you see, all the way up through strata from the time of the poem's composition to 2001 of print editions. Those are the ones in orange. 
Um, it was an experiment. This just takes WorldCat data and transforms it into a three-dimensional interactive map. Um, an even better example is a platform and, uh, that MetaLab was commissioned to build by the um, largest unit of Harvard University, which is a platform for course discovery and exploration. Students at a university like Harvard, typically they, they used to have a, a volume, a book, that they used to make their choices of their optional courses as they moved their way through their different specializations. Um, and that became a database in 1990, but stripping away a lot of the richness of documentation or material that students had available to them. So Curricle was an attempt to, to do something much more than just inventory the choices that they had, to use visualization tools to allow students to look at the curriculum as a kind of living, pulsing, interactive network of choices um, these are the kinds of screen uh, representations that you see when you go onto this platform. You look at two terms, knowledge, networks, and what you see is the whole universe of courses that bring together those two uh, terms rather than just at a series of discrete um, courses um, treated individually and inventory, which would be the more conventional way of representing them. And here, for example, is a zoomed out vision of the whole universe of courses in a single semester of the university that includes thousands of different options that are available. The ability to navigate between that zoomed out view and to move in to that kind of more intimate course level view is precisely what the experience is about. And here's even a research platform about the history of the curriculum that's woven into this experience. So these are just simply examples of the kinds of things that can be done. A second example, um, before I transition to, <clears throat> to the part, part Y of my presentation, is an intervention that we created inside the Harvard Art Museum, which is an experience of a gallery, an interactive gallery, that tries to add value to the experience of visitors as they go through Har the Harvard Art Museum. They see 1,800 objects, and when they get to this last gallery, they see all 1,800 objects together and they have an opportunity to interact with them, not as objects, because they've already done that, but as a database with data fields and with, as one pulls them up out of that mosaic that you see initially, you get a data record and you are able with a pointer to choose any of those fields, click on the, um, in this case, the accession year tag and see a visualization on the opposite wall that tells you exactly where this object fits in the family of 1800 objects. In other words, to see each object's object as a network, not as an individual object. This is something that databases do brilliantly, and it's different from the experience, the one-to-one -one experience, that kind of multi-sensory experience of an artistic object that we don't want to substitute for. We want to augment, we want to add to, we want to enrich through the experience of data. That's the kind of work that interests me as a cultural practitioner uh, who works between the creative, the cultural, and the um, entrepreneurial. Um, so I'm gonna jump ahead here. Um, I, I mentioned the importance of being willing and able to work with data to learn some of the skills that are necessary to have a deep understanding of what kind of material data is. Data is not immaterial. It's part of a kind of materiality that needs to be crafted, needs to be shaped. And data is not external to culture. It is cultural heritage today. Now, I'm going to step in now to the second <clears throat> and final part of my presentation, which has to do with an outcropping of my work in the um, arts and humanities fields with a strong interest in the technical. And that is um, Piaggio Fast Forward, which was literally born <clears throat> through a conversation that started up with a series of senior executives at the Piaggio Group um, over the future of mobility. Um, and uh, that startup enterprise really began by asking a question, which is what will be the forms of movement that characterize the cities of tomorrow? Of course, the city of tomorrow is, uh, uh, is a question that has been asked over and over again in the course of the Industrial Revolution. Here you're seeing a film from the New York World's Fair in the 1930s 
Norman Bel Geddes, the great American industrial designer, dreaming of the city of the future. And you can see that it's very much like the city of today, which is to say city, cities that have been sacrificed on the altar <clears throat> of automobility, um, this kind of romance of the road that turned highways, uh, super highways, into the kind of main avenues, the main uh, mobility vectors of our cities and have created uh, cities that are completely paralyzed by automobile traffic um, and um, with environmental consequences that are familiar to us uh, throughout the world, essentially uh, reducing our ability to enjoy outdoor spaces, ruining the atmosphere, um, and also limiting the amount of mobility that people exercise in their daily life choices with catastrophic health consequences. So it's in this context that Piaggio Fast Forward was launched as a think tank originally to ask the question of what will the city of tomorrow be like? Is it going to be a city like that continues that automobile centered narrative that uh, Norman Bel Geddes was dreaming of in the 1930s? Is Tomorrowland a world filled with autonomous automobiles that still own most of the cityscape, that still occupy um, something like 15 to 20% in the form of parking spaces that have been allocated just for storing automobiles? Will human beings be wearing virtual uh, world headsets as they navigate in their autonomous uh, uh, vehicles rather than um, engaging in forms of human-centered mobility? Um, and will autonomous vehicles, autonomous automobiles, who have been the protagonist of a lot of the debates about the future of cities, really be be become those agents? Um, we felt that the answer was no. Not only are self-driving cars um, proving to be a technology that keeps on, whose, whose tr moment of truth is being postponed, but also there are real, not just technical issues, but also moral, societal, cultural issues around mobility that are often forgotten in those futuristic discussion. Um, and the moral machine experiment, which is an online experiment that some colleagues at MIT carried on, um, is an interesting instance. What it showed, unsurprisingly, is that the choice of the so-called uh, so trolley question of if you have software driving your car when it has to choose between killing the passengers and killing pedestrians in the case of a mechanical failure, who, does, who gets sacrificed? Who gets chosen as the victim of a misfunction, uh, the kinds of misfunctions we associate with accidents in traffic systems? Um, the answer, of course, is it depends on what culture you belong to. It depends on your values. Whose life should we spare is a moral choice. Um, so all of that brings to, into center focus the human factor. And that's the kind of factor that people with a deep uh, understanding of the arts and humanities, unsurprisingly, have insights into. And it's that human-centered approach that infused the work that my colleague Greg Lynn and I did um, as co-founders of Piaggio Fast Forward, working with the company leadership, to really think about movement from the standpoint, not of machines, not of autonomy for, hu for machines or for automobiles, but rather autonomy for humans. How do people actually move? How do they like to move? How could such mobility choices inform healthy lifestyles, healthy models of society? Our work um, has come uh, now assumed after four and a half, uh, five years of, uh, of development, the form of a robotic vehicle that supports pedestrian mobility choices. That's the vehicle that you see on your screen. It's called Gita, it means a short, a pleasure trip in Italian. Um, and Gita is a small carrier robot with a cargo bin uh, that follows a human a pedestrian that encourages people to walk rather than to drive um, because through by using all of the same technologies that autonomous automobiles uh, uh, use sensors uh, radar infrared um, artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques but it uses them to create a smart vehicle that actually leverages the incredible expertise that we as humans have developed in navigating pedestrian spaces. Pedestrian spaces are difficult, they're complex. They include lots of obstacles. They're also civic spaces, they're human spaces, they're spaces of social interaction. So rather than try to replace human mobility, our aim, and again, this is deeply aligned, I think, 
with a kind of hum human-centered approach is to animate those spaces, to leverage a number of trends that are reshaping the world, and I think that the COVID-19 crisis is actually reinforcing, um, the desire to live, work, and play in spaces that are physically proximate, to reconnect to our neighborhoods, to that kind of local scale, to get away from just living on screens, whether they're little screens or big screens. And third, to reconnect to the natural world, to the great outdoors. And all of these are key factors in quality of life um, calculations that are made and that will be integral to the design of towns and cities uh, today and tomorrow. So how do we promote walking instead of riding, instead of being um, increasingly passive passengers in automobiles? Um, and walking is people's favorite way of moving around the world, throughout the world. Uh, um, but when you look at the actual choices that people make, uh, they walk much less than they, they say they'd like to walk. So how do we change that? Well, as a group of designers, and in fact, Piaggio Fassuardo was initially only designers. We didn't hire any engineers for the first six months. We just worked on concept development. One of the answers is to remove the obstacles to walking. And of course, walking's correlation with physical health and with mental and with social health is a very powerful one. We see that in all kinds of statistics about obesity, about um, social disengagement and so forth. So our approach was, let's remove the biggest obstacle. The biggest obstacle is that we carry stuff. When we move around the world and we move in these pedestrian spaces, these human spaces, we uh, often carry things and not everybody can carry things and carrying things re immediately imposes a limit on the radius of our work. So our focus was, can we develop robots that understand pedestrian etiquette, that understand the human rules, these complex rules of civic spaces, the sidewalk, how we interact and move around the world. So what you see here, I think, is an embodiment of how a culturally based approach, how creative practice and how industrial or entrepreneurial ambitions can come together and come together in a kind of value infused and value laden form uh, to promote a vision of the future of cities, a vision of cities as walkable, as walking friendly, as not automobile centered, but rather human centered. And I think I'll stop there and very much look forward to our discussion uh, when we meet and um, have uh, an hour to uh, dialogue. I'm happy to, in that context, to come back to some of these points and ideas um, to say more about them or um, also to speak um, outside of this framework more broadly about the links between the technical and the, the artistic and humanistic. Thank you.